All right, everybody, this is Idaho Ambassador back again, and we've decided to move our podcast along with some video, so hello. We will pretend like you're not there, though, once the intro begins, uh, or ends, if you will. Today, we are sitting with Jacob Black, uh, born and raised Boise native and the owner of Lost Grove Brewing. With that being said, we have our kombucha, and we're ready to chat. So if you don't mind, Jacob, would you give us a little bit of like a background on who you are and why you kind of decided to go into the beer industry? Uh, so I'm a Boise native. I was uh, born here in Boise, Idaho, back in 86. <laughs> Just dated myself. Back in the day. Back in the day. <laughs> um, and I kind of was born into a family of entrepreneurs. So my grandfather started a business uh, that I semi grew up in. My mother owned her own business. My aunts and uncles started different businesses throughout Boise. And so I've always kind of been intrigued, um, not only in business, but in self-employment. Yeah, uh, you know, I feel that. Right, right. <laughs> Jake's actually my cousin, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so at a young age, uh, I started working for my mother when I was 11. Uh, and I helped run uh, distribution for downtown Boise for office product store. To be honest, I think it was a sales pitch on my mom's side to have <laughs> yeah. a bunch of 11-year-olds uh, <laughs> delivering business products in downtown Boise. It makes sense. Giving out little candies. Uh, but it was a ton of fun. I actually, as, as much as you could say, ran the uh, four or five of my friends that worked for my mother during the summers, uh, the distribution <laughs> of downtown Boise business products. You were the boss of the minions. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, it was a ton of fun. Uh, we pulled wagons around and all that, but I'd say that's really how I got my start um, into small business. When I was 15, uh, I was a big fan of lacrosse, and uh, lacrosse here in Boise was just getting started. And so a couple of good friends of mine, we started the first uh, lacrosse store here in Boise, Belax Lacrosse Company. I remember that. Out of my mom's store. I was going to say, it was in the store, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Love it that. was, uh, yeah, tucked in the back corner, uh, and it's actually a successful uh fun little venture that we got into um we sold the cross equipment for about two years uh unfortunately uh we had to make a decision if we wanted to play lacrosse or uh, continue to sell lacrosse equipment so our coach was getting pretty mad that one of us was always missing practices <laughs> yeah. uh, to run the store he's like do you actually want to play or <laughs> just make money yeah exactly i know what i would have chosen <laughs> <laughs> at the time playing lacrosse was pretty fun uh so we transitioned into summer lacrosse camps so we ran actually summer lacrosse camps for uh How long was that? seven years oh, we did summer lacrosse camps after that um, which was a ton of fun got into coaching and so on and so forth but I really found my love for uh, the beer business from Bitter Creek Ale House. I started working at Bitter Creek when I was 15 as well um, and just saw the vibrancy of the restaurant business and the beer culture and so on and so forth and that was when I kind of decided that I really wanted to get into the bar and restaurant industry. Well, and beer, beer culture industry. is kind of like wine culture, right? Like it's, they're very much like, oh, this one has so hints of such and such. And this one, like, I obviously don't drink beer because I'm gluten free, but I did <laughs> many right. times. And people will sit down and they'll go through things with beer and they'll be like, I'll sample this one. And then I'll sample this one. Oh, for sure. I mean, especially nowadays. I mean, when, you know, when I first started working at Bitter Creek, they were just like every other beer bar uh, in town for the most part, other than they you know, had a ton of great craft beer on tap, but it only rotated every six months to a year. But oh, wow. at that point, that was still ahead of its time. you know. Uh, and they were sourcing as locally as they could. And then you know, we, there was only four breweries in Boise, so their local sourcing was from Seattle and Portland area. Northwest, and, rather. Yeah, exactly, in California. And, um, by watching that kind of transition was really cool just through the 2000s the early 2000s you know bitter creek went from rotating every six months to rotating every month to rotating every single handle uh, yeah. every time a new beer comes up how many handles you know? do they have now so now i believe they're at 44 taps Whoa. is what they have so that's insane right and, and i'm assuming you're on some of them yeah and what's cool now too is the fact that we have you know 18 
Treasure Valley, well, really 18 Boise breweries in the Treasure Valley were at about 22, 23 breweries. I should probably know that off the top of my head. That's but, insane. Uh, so that's crazy, yeah. right? In the last 10 years, really in the last seven years, we've had uh, close to 18 breweries just open up. Yeah, that's, Boise, that's nuts. Which is cool. And do you, I know a lot of people, I'm kind of going to tangent, but I know a lot of people are kind of like, there's breweries everywhere. Like, I mean... You being a, like an avid local, I feel like maybe you're really supportive of that happening. But I mean, what's the news in the industry about how many are popping up and what's going on with them? Like, uh, I think it's I think it's like any other business, especially I think it's very similar to like the restaurant business. Yeah. Where if you know your business and you know your niche, and if you can create a good product and bring good service. Um, I think that there's an endless number, you know, I mean, you could say the same thing about restaurants, really. Yeah. Uh, people like, you know, Bitter Creek, people like Tap House, people like Fork, people like Barnet, people like Bargarnica, you know, all those are examples of places that also have good service and good food, so on and so forth. But um, they continue to see more and more open, but we also continue to see more and more close. And I think that's going to happen with breweries and not that we want that to happen, but my point being is that there will always be the opportunity to open a brewery. Yeah. It's whether or not the entrepreneur is successful in their, in their venture. Yeah. You know? And, and, if and they, dedicated for what they're really doing. Right. And if they do it, you know, do it properly and do it right. Well, cause it's, you know how people are like, Oh, there's like 800 taco shops. There's so many breweries, but it's like in the same, right. If you do it right and you're really doing it for the right reason, I think that will show through rather than people. It's like, Oh, so you just have money and you decided you start a brewery. Well, it's, you know, I always call it too, it's like the sexy industry. Yeah. You know, everybody says growing up or even when they're older, like, I want to own a sports bar or I really want to own a bar. And a lot of people are fortunate enough to make money in other avenues and they decide, oh, now I can own my bar, mm -hmm. thinking that it's um, an easy industry. You which know, is like, not. If they build it, they will come, which, you know, in some <laughs> cases can be true if you build it correctly, but... <laughs> But a lot of the intense. times, most people think it in the sense that if they build it, they also don't have to work anymore. Yeah. You know, that it's just this cash cow, which unfortunately that's not, <laughs> the, not case. the case. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's definitely like you build it, you better still show up. <laughs> yeah. You still got to work a lot, a lot more hours than you were probably working at your last job. Oh, no joke. Honest, the restaurant you know? industry and beer, I'm sure beer and wine is included is insanity. For sure. I mean, it's your baby, right? It's 24-7. Yeah. And I think, mm -hmm. I agree. I think people look at it and they're like, oh, well, why don't you guys just be open this day? And you're like, uh, well, maybe Sunday is like the one day a week we have off. Right. And I still work that day, by say, the or way. Or do our books. Or, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right, not have you know, to, all those other yeah. little things I have to do besides conversate with you while you sit at the bar. <laughs> exactly. So you did, so you went lacrosse store, lacrosse camps. And then where did you go after that? Uh, and so then um, I actually went to culinary school for a bit. So when I you know, found my passion and the idea of the bar, restaurant, um, kind of beer scene. Mm -hmm. So I actually went to culinary school over in Portland nice. and got the hospitality and restaurant degree uh, over there. And then came back and worked at Bitter Creek Ale House for another three years. And there managed all aspects uh, of that business from bar manager to front of house manager to kitchen manager to ordering beers, uh, kind of so on and so forth. Yeah. Uh, and at that time, uh, a friend of mine from high school reconnected me with another friend of mine from high school, uh, Mike Francis, mm -hmm. who is the um, owner of Payette Brewing Company. And we both had a similar idea. And so I was telling friend A from high school, hey, I really want to open up a brew pub. I think I'm going to leave Bitter Creek here to open up a brew pub. Yeah. And he's like, dude, Mike Francis is thinking about opening up a brewery. He's about to quit his job at Boeing and open up this brewery. You guys should talk. Mm -hmm. And so that's really how I got my foot in the door in the brewery business. So Mike and I started chatting. Uh, he was, you know, had a bunch of questions when he was writing his business plan for PayEd on what the distribution was going on here in Boise and you know what keg prices were and how it worked and so on and so forth. And uh, so we'd meet, we probably met up two or three times actually in Boise and then exchanged some emails while he still was over in Seattle. Yeah. Um, and about the time that he moved back to Boise to really get serious on it, 
Uh, I was just quitting Bitter Creek. Oh, okay. And had gotten a cool opportunity down in Nicaragua uh, to help a buddy start a bar. So I popped down to Nicaragua for about a year. Was it a year? Yeah, I was down there for. Close I feel like to a brother year. was down there what four months with you yep, or something. Yep, yep. Uh, <laughs> running a sailboat charter. Which sailboat was charter. Craziest, crazy, crazy adventure. <laughs> uh, and so yeah, so I took off for about a year um, while Mike was kind of gathering investors, and so on and so forth. We were still in contact via email, mm-hmm. um, and kind of got some travel bug out of my system which is needed which is and tons of fun especially when you also have to like dive into something that hard when you come back it's like you gotta get it out you gotta go you gotta see be ready stuff. to work you yeah know, you gotta be ready to work <laughs> ready for the grind yeah and so in august of 2010 um i basically sold myself to mike when i was down in nicaragua saying hey buddy uh, if you're ready to open, you know, this is what I can do for your company and send him a kind of a blank resume cover letter. And yeah. so, yeah, so he hit me back and said, you know, when can you come back and start this off with me? So I moved back in December of 2010 and started working with Mike. And about six months later, we opened uh, Pay yeah. Brewing Company in May. And uh, so I ran the distribution and sales. I remember uh, the first canning adventure in the back yep. of that <laughs> like oh wait this one didn't lock right that was that was an adventure that was crazy yeah the whole beginnings of Payette were quite the whirlwind uh, oh, sure. there was just the two of us for the first really for almost the first year and it was went from zero to 60 Boise had never really had a distribution brewery mm-hmm. you know Sockeye and Highlands Hollow had done a great job of you know opening the door to you know, starting to get beers on tap around town. Yeah. But none of them were solely focused on that. They both had brew pubs and were really just, you know, their getting retail a consumer to come. Their retail was more of their Yeah, their that was the bread cow. and butter. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so Mike's concept and, you know, kind of my plan with him was like, hey, let's get this. There's 250 accounts, you know, throughout yeah. the Treasure Valley. Let's put our beer on tap. Let's wholesale all this thing. There's no reason that all of them shouldn't have you know, pay it on these taps. Yeah. And so that's what we did. And it took off like crazy. Mike was making really good beer. I was fortunate enough to have a ton of really good connections throughout the bar and restaurant industry. Yeah. And we were able to, you know, grow that brand to, by the time I left Payette in 2000, December of 2015, uh, Payette at that point was in six states and was doing over 10,000 barrels of beer on an annual basis. That's insane. And we were the largest local brewery here in town, uh, distribution-wise just in the city. And then we were also the largest brewery in Idaho. So it was a crazy steep uh, curve for sure. The growth was like. (laughs) Yeah, and then also, you know, the learning curve was also pretty intense. Like you said, I mean, (laughs) deciding to get into cans was insane. We had like a little mobile canning (laughs) guy show up and we would can for, 48 hours straight. Yeah, you know, were, were those all-nighters? I remember being there to like 3 or 4 a.m. one time. And so, like, yeah. Just keep, just keep going. It was nuts, yeah. So Mike and I would work our day shifts when the canning guys would show up and the back of the house guys would be canning and then uh, Mike and I would work till 7 a.m. and then go home and sleep for three hours and come back and work our day shifts and then work till 7 a.m. So it was, we cranked out a ton of time, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, knocking out that product and getting it That sweat equity. But, Sweat equity is crazy. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, towards towards the end of that stint, you know, learned a ton from Pay at Brewing Company. But again, in having that, you know, entrepreneurial spirit from when I was young and, um, you know, wanting to be able to uh, really have the full vision of where I see the business heading, mm-hmm. um, it was time for me to, you know, move on to a different do project, do my yeah. own thing. You know, yeah. Mike's... That was Mike's baby and Mike's vision. And uh, we were kind of seeing different avenues or paths that we thought the business should go. Mm -hmm. So we've had a great um, transition of me opening up my own business and Payette's been phenomenal for us. We still clean our kegs over there. And if we have questions on, you know, something that's going on in the brewery area, you know, Mike's been more than helpful to, you know, give him a call. Well, I think it's funny because I think a lot of people that own or begin startups or have questions about them, which by the way, startups are not just tech companies. <laughs> they can be brick and mortars too. I, it drives me crazy when people are like, oh, you want a startup? What kind of tech are you in? I'm like, 
it's not tech. It's still a startup. It's a small right. business. Like, yeah. but it's funny that a lot of people have this mentality of like, it's every man for themselves, you know? And it's like, that's, does not need to be the case. There's how many breweries in this town? And they're all doing pretty well. Like, you know what I mean? So it's right. like, you can call and ask for help. That's allowed. Right. You know and, what I mean? Or develop that relationship so that you can. Well, and starting a business is hard as like hard enough as on its own. Yeah. Um, to try and think that you need to recreate the wheel mm -hmm. if there's a question that you're having trouble finding an answer to. Most likely somebody that's in that same industry or that same business yeah. has come across that yeah. path, you know, and they've had to see wh where should I go, what should I do with this. Yeah, I'm not saying that you know when you talk to them that you need to take the path that, that they're telling you about mm -hmm. that they took, um, but at least you can get a concept on why they went down that path, and you know, potentially that can help guide you on whatever path you want to take. But at least you'll be able to answer a few of those questions that have been yeah uh, troubling to yourself. I think a lot of people are just kind of scared to ask that question, and I think it's super important to just like. Why don't you just be friendly, develop the relationship, and ask? Well, I think a lot of people are afraid to look stupid, you know? Yeah. And oh, I yeah. think that, I'm like, sure. by asking a question, then it makes them look vulnerable or that, you know, they, they don't shouldn't. Know what they're doing. They know what they're doing or they yeah. shouldn't be doing what they're doing, you know? Yeah. Um, and well, really, it's. I'm just... developing a shipping container park, as you well know, and right. I've never developed anything before, like, especially to that scale, and I'm like, Dude, I don't know. I literally, I tell people, I'm like, I got no clue, but I'm going to find out right. <laughs> and I'm going to ask all these people. This one guy gave right. me slack one time and was like, cause you know, he was like, you don't know what you're doing. You've never done a development before. And I was like, astute observation. But the, <laughs> but the first time you developed something, you probably had never done it before either. Right. And right. he was like, oh, and I was like, yeah, so <laughs> just chill, bro. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. I mean, and that's, and that's really, that's all it is, is not just being afraid to take that step, you know, or yeah. step off the ledge. Uh, and when you're falling, make sure you're asking for help and looking for places that, you know, people can guide you. Yeah. You know, finding a good mentor or things of that nature are always super helpful as what well. What do you think your biggest, like, barrier to entry was for, like, for Lost Grove? Uh, I mean, raising capital was definitely a lot harder um, than I was expecting it to be, mm -hmm. you know, which sounds funny uh, because obviously raising capital is going to be hard. Uh, <laughs> But, but I mean, you know enough people that one may assume it could be a little easier than for somebody who doesn't know anybody. Right. Yeah, yeah exactly. You know, or for people that aren't necessarily as outgoing, you mm -hmm. know, and that's one thing that I think, you know, both of us are uh, lucky enough to be pretty outgoing and not willing to talk to people yeah. and, and willing to ask dumb questions. Right. Yeah. You know, and like, ask, well, for know, for, yeah, <laughs> ask for money. <laughs> what's what's they're going to do? <laughs> say no. Right. Exactly. <laughs> they're probably going to say yes. Yeah. So you're, so when you did raise your capital, what, where did you find your sources? Was it, are they some of them out of state? Are they in state? Are they like family or direct friends? Uh, and so I definitely, you know, took that path that you got to start with the people that are going to believe in you the most, Of course. you know? Um, unless you just have this, unless you're a rocket scientist or, you know, have this brilliant concept that yeah. nobody's thought of, which are one in a million, yeah. you know, are you going to be able to just go to a venture capitalist and say, I got this idea and that one guy's going to be like, sweet funding. I'll it. take it. You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, and so that's, you know, really how I kind of started was like, all right, well, I need to start talking to friends and family about if they would actually invest, you know? And then. Not only if they would actually invest, but put the time and energy myself into creating the proper business plan, mm -hmm. creating the proper channels, protecting their assets for if they were to invest in me, you know, so getting yeah. key man life insurance, getting an operating agreement put in place, yeah. you know, so on and so forth. Uh, so that when my friends and family said, I'll invest, I could say, sweet, here's the bank account. Yeah. Here's the paperwork. You're protected. Sign up, you know, this is how it works. Who did you go to to help you set, did you do that all yourself or did you have somebody help you set up like your, your filing when it came to what shares are going where and all of that? Did you do that in house or did you have someone else do that? So I did a lot of the research myself to figure out what I needed to do, you know, and realize yeah. that it was a score U7, uh, which is, um, it's a subsection of the SEC that allows you to raise capital um, just through, for, from anybody. Yeah. So there's accredited and unaccredited investors, mm -hmm. um, which an accredited investor, I guess, just to kind of explain it, right, is somebody that has a million dollars in assets uh, or makes over $200,000 a year. Yeah. Is the simplest way. Unaccredited investor is basically everybody else. Okay.
and how the feds so it's just see the it. friends and the family who just got cash, whereas like VC would be accredited. Okay. Yeah, you know, and um, and that's the thing that's funny, right? It's how the government sees it as if you're not already rich, then apparently you're not intelligent enough to make a decision to invest in a small business. <laughs> well, that, that sounds about right. Right, Thanks and federal so, government. Yeah, and so there's it's quite the form to put together, and so I used uh, a local attorney here in town. Yeah. Uh, to help put together my full, you know, business um, proposal to be able to uh, turn that into to the SEC, basically all. to get it all legally signed okay, cool. and so on and so forth. Well, so, what was your so your biggest barrier entry was was raising the capital? But what what do you think has been the most to you the most beneficial thing since you've opened? Like, what's your favorite part about? Like, I know your concept is finding your own loss growth, right? Which mm-hmm. in turn to me, as you've explained, is everybody has their own little thing that they love either doing or being at, or it's their own little safe space. So what is like, what is it about Lost Grove that has created that for you? Um, yeah, and to kind of emphasize more on like what finding in Lost Grove is, it's, it's finding what makes you happy, you yeah. know, is the biggest thing. So not even just your space space, but just, you know, what you do on a daily basis that's going to, when you wake up, you're excited about it or that you're happy about it. And so for me, it's the idea of, you know, owning your own business, but also then being able to guide it in the direction that you want to go. And with the beer business, it's a very social business. You know, oh, yeah. Drinking beer is about hanging out with your friends, you know. Mm-hmm. And for me, that's my last grove is hanging out with my friends and family and enjoying ourselves, you yeah. know. And so it's having that opportunity to get our, uh, our brand and our passion into as many different activities that are happening throughout the Boise or Treasure Valley, yeah. you know, the, potentially like, Idaho. The local scene, yeah. The local scene, you know, it's like trying to be involved with the Discovery um, Center over here. They have their adult night, you know, so like we want to be a part of that to make it, you know, a fun party, yeah. you know, and be able to provide the alcohol to that. And like Idaho Gibbs Day is coming up on May 3rd. Yeah. And so we're working with the nonprofit center to throw a big party for Idaho Gibbs. Yeah. Um, because to have a party, you got to have alcohol. Well, and so. you guys, <laughs> I mean, like, I know other breweries do it as well, but you guys are very heavily involved in philanthropy. I mean, what is it? At least once a week, I feel like you're having some sort of event that, like, it's pints for... So we do our Powerful Pints. Powerful Pints. Yeah. yeah. So Powerful Pints is every second Tuesday mm-hmm. uh, of the month we... Uh, team up with another a nonprofit, mm-hmm. different nonprofit every month, and on that night we give fifty percent of our total sales to the nonprofit, and then for the next week we have our powerful pints tap handle, okay. where we give two dollars of every beer sold. from that tap handle sold uh, to that nonprofit. Oh, okay, cool. And then at the end of that week um, we team up with a bar restaurant that is that serves our product. Mm-hmm. And we uh, donate uh, a keg to them. So they actually buy a keg from us and then we write a check to the nonprofit for that price. Oh, okay. And then they donate 100% of the sales from that beer. So you're double ending it for the, for yeah. the donation. Oh, that's and, cool. And the biggest reason with that end piece is um, our goal isn't just for us to try and give back to the community. Mm-hmm. It's to try and help or teach or show other entrepreneurs and businesses yeah. uh, in the valley that giving back to the community is a good thing. Yeah, you know, 100%. And that it can help your business. Like it can bring people in and it makes awareness for your business and it feels good to be able to know that like Absolutely. you're giving back to, to that community. Well, and I think a lot of people nowadays, they take a little more initiative if it is, you know, if there is a charitable contribution involved. They'll go sure. a little bit more out of their way to either purchase that or go there or do those things, which, I mean, in a town like this, you you have to support your nonprofits. I mean, that's right. major. I mean, you guys are right behind Boise Bicycle Project, which is awesome because it makes it super easy for you to partner with them, too. Yeah, and they're yeah. great people, you know, and yeah, fun to work cool. with. And I, I think the, the hardest thing, too, so running a business as a, as a whole is just hard. Yeah. <laughs> right? And so to also try and keep it in your mind's eye that, you want to have a charitable outreach. There's a lot of people out there that run businesses, but are just busy, yeah. you know, and their business itself doesn't necessarily have a great avenue to give back, mm-hmm. you know, or even to kind of promote to their customers that they are about giving back, mm-hmm. you know, without their customers potentially like 
really having to dig in. Mm -hmm. And so for us, it's to show those people that are busy, like, hey, you just have to say yes and we'll help like navigate that you guys are giving back to this. Yeah. You and know? I think, so it's like trying to just bring that. Well, and the, the partnerships is major, right? So it's right. like, I think a lot of people nowadays, like we talked about earlier, it's every man for themselves. It's like, no, why not partner on something? I get to expose our business to your clientele that may not know about us, but then you get to expose your clientele to us. And it's an equal, you know, benefit to both parties. But a lot of people I think are such of an old school, maybe it's because we're in Boise. But there's a lot of businesses just such an old school mindset where it's like brand partnerships. What's that? It's like right. they're major right now. I mean, and I mean we're fully a for profit business. Yeah. You know, like um, my investors did not invest to just give, <laughs> to give everything stuff away. away. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. I don't uh, think so. <laughs> you know, and so it is. You, you know, obviously we do keep that in mind, mm -hmm. um, but. Getting to know other people that are, you know, business owners, um, you just got to continue to spread the word about each other and yeah, keep building. And so yeah, I think I think Boise is growing so fast that it's going to be a little bit insane in the next five years. I mean, what fastest growing city in the U.S. Right? Yeah, I know. I don't think we've been on more Forbes articles or we were in Vogue. I was like, wait, Boise, Idaho is in Vogue? That doesn't make any sense. It's crazy. It's going to be nuts. And you've got, yeah. what, like a taco shop coming in next door? Yeah, and they seem like really fun people and are definitely in the yeah. same vibe that they want to give back, which is really cool. Um, but yeah, they're supposed to open here in the next, like, two weeks I, or something, mid-April. I think mid -April. popped up overnight. I, mean, yeah. I feel like I hadn't been down here for, like, a week or two, and then it was like... I drove by last night and was like, this is insane. They're cranking on it. Yeah, yeah which crazy. would be good for you, but they better be serving your beer over there. They are. They're planning on it. Oh, <laughs> well, yeah, good. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, cool. Sounds nice guy. Um, I, I need to wrap up, I think, because you have a tasting appointment, which yes. is good. Got to yeah. make those sales. You, you tell them <laughs> I say hi over there. Cool, and thank you. Yeah. And uh, we'll be sure to tag you and, of course, partner with you. But Appreciate it. Thank you, everybody, for watching, and have a great day. Thanks, Hills. Thanks.